Welcome back to Memory Lane. My name is Craig Crash Collins. I am joined alongside by Brandon Scott, otherwise known as B. Scott. This is episode three of Memory Lane, where we take a look at some past events, um, usually ones of significant date in the calendar year. Um, this week, we take a look at the Indy 500. The Indy 500 is going to uh, be happening this weekend obviously without fans, so that's really kind of a bummer, B. Scott, but uh, um, this one was with fans. This was 2011, um, and we want to take a look back at this one um, because it was a very significant one as far as uh, the late, great Dan Weldon. Um, you know, I was a big fan. I know you were a big fan as well, B. Scott, of, of Dan Weldon. Um, this was his last um, uh, 8,500 win, of course, later in the 2011 season um is when uh he tragically passed away at las vegas um so we wanted to show that because not only was it the you know the last win and the last indy 500 win of an indy car icon at the time um but and still is but we also wanted to show it because it, of the way this race ends uh with the stuff with jr hildebrand and stuff like that on the very last lap so it's a, a, a very fun one to dive into b scott yeah, definitely. And also gave us one of the best liveries of uh, past Indy 500 winners. Uh, that William Rost, bright orange and white and black car. That, that was probably one of the coolest looking cars to win the 500 in recent memories. I mean, at J.R. Hildebrand won, that probably also been, would have been one of the coolest looking cars to win the Indy 500 as well. So, uh, but just this race was just a really hard fought race and had one of those had one of those memorable endings that uh you, you'll never you're never going to forget um it, you know it wasn't the uh the mark and uh you know it was it wasn't like the 2006 indy 500 by any means um you know that one was super close but you know this one <laughs> This one is, uh, is is very interesting in its own regards. Well, you have all that and you know intrigue as well as in the fact that like for so many years Sam Hornish dominated uh, in the number four Panther racing car. Of course, he then goes on to go to Penske, wins the Indy 500 in 2006. Um, so they do have the young J.R. Hildebrand. This is probably the closest Panther has been to having a car good enough to potentially. Uh, win the Indy 500 since those Sam Hornish days. So, of course, there was a lot going into that. And, dude, just one corner. One corner made all the difference. Um, so, with that, uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. We're at lap uh, 164. Um, so, we're going to watch the last 30, 40 laps here. So, it should be fun. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Pressing play now. We come back to green flag racing. We'll talk about those guys that hit it right before going back. This is the re the last restart of the race. So any restart for the Indy 500 is just amazing. Seeing those cars coming in, I mean, obviously the, the start itself is probably the best part, but any restart of the Indy 500, them coming around turn four and two wide, and they start to fan out going down the front straightaway. I mean, to see those cars get three, possibly even four wide going down the front straight, that, that's just unbelievable. And to think that Dan Weldon was, uh, you know, he wasn't even in the top five when this restart happened, that, that makes it even more impressive. He had to get around some, some pretty tough competitors, on mostly, most notably, you know, Tony Kanaan, Scott Dixon. I mean, those guys know their way around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He had, he had Danica coming up right behind him as long as Ed Carpenter. Um, so that that it, it makes it pretty impressive, but I mean, look, you got Lotus in this field. Remember when Lotus was actually part of the Indy 500 fray? I mean, geez, that's it, it's not that long ago, but here they are. They're 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 there, and um, you know now we're starting to see McLaren get into the fray as well. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the names and. Uh, and like numbers on the top of the screen here ryan hunter ray in the number 41 you have tony Kanan in the number 82 like i don't remember what was going on tony like Kanan was a lotus driver tony Kanan was a lotus driver that's correct i forgot all about that and then and the sam schmidt car was alex tagliani yeah paul tracy james was in this race this year in the number six 
I'm pretty sure Tagliani had the pole for this race. Tags seemed to have the pole for about like several straight years. I mean, he had a run going there, uh, typical of a head carpenter as of late. But um, Tagliani seemed to, you know, he was really good on for qualifying, but then just completely fell apart from race day. This is interesting. Graham Rahal leading the race. I mean, this is a name that we've, we've talked about several times in looking at the Indy 500. Graham Rahal is one of those drivers that's definitely due. And I think this is probably the closest he's actually come to winning the race so far. So it'll be interesting to see um, how his maturity has gone. I mean, look, he started 29th in this race and all the way up to first. That's the nice thing. That's the great thing about the Indy 500. It, you can you can have a, a, a fairly strong car and start any, if you have a strong car, you can start anywhere in this pack right. and work your way up to the front. Just me work methodically and it can happen. The race is long enough. Anything can happen and you can work your way from last all the way up to first pretty easily. Maybe not easily, but you can you, you can do it. It's, right. It can happen. You see some names cross, uh, across the top, and I promise I'm not just looking at the leaderboard across the top. We look at some other names across the top there. Um, the late, great Justin Wilson, late, great uh, John Andretti also in this field. Paul Tracy, 24 laps down. What is going on? Far, a far cry from the photo finish with Elio Castroneves in 2002. Was that 02? I believe it was, yeah. Simona de Silvestro, wow. Takuma Sato. 2017 dead champion, dead last. Oriel Servia, he does not have a ride for this year's Indy 500. He will not be making a return to the Yard of Bricks. I, that's a big one. Oriel Servia for a while there, and even, I mean, obviously this year too, was like the, in 2011, is just kind of one of those names that isn't really on a lot of people's radar, but I feel like he had some good Indy 500 runs. Oh, yeah. He always has. I mean, it wasn't it, it was just uh, two years ago. He was up there about ready to win the race. Right. The uh, Will Power won. Yeah, the one that we, the last one that we watched. That's why, uh, I think that's why it clicked off in my brain. They're like, wait a minute. Vitor Mira, I mean, geez, Buddy Rice. 2004 winner. And look, there's a familiar face that hasn't, like, we talked about the different rides and stuff. That's one that hasn't really changed is Scott Dixon. Just no longer target. No, no longer target. Dario Franchitti in this field as well. Davey Hamilton, Townsend Bell. I mean, these are a lot of the broadcasters now. <laughs> Some names Ryan that... Bristow, whose wife basically berated you on our radio show. Oh, uh, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that was actually was the caution. You, you called, didn't you call Tony Stewart washed up or something? Yeah, because I, th I think it was... Because it was towards... Brett Musburger on the call here for ESPN. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> You don't like Brett Musburger? I've never been a fan of Brett Musburger. Brett Musburger, to me, is one of the most um, biased, when, especially when it came down to calling college football games. There were certain teams he just did not like, yeah. and it really came out in his play calling, or in his play-by-play. -play. It, it just... Oh, here's a banger. Here's a song. <laughs> They're playing, uh, I throw my hands up in the air sometimes. This, this was a, this was definitely a Craig and B Scott on campus jam right here. <laughs> Service Central. Graham having to pit. Yeah, Graham Rahal. Maybe this is a hot take. You know, maybe it's just the fact that I you know we just talked about one of my hot takes with Tony Stewart. Um, I I think Graham Rahal like of the two like. You know, legacy. I don't know if you want to call them that. Legacies in the IndyCar series right now with Marco and Graham. Like I, I still have like more faith in what Graham can do than I do with what what Marco can do. Like, well, I, I don't I, think that's a hot take at all. Okay, I, I think that's that's. That, I mean, I think a lot of people feel that way. Just when you look at the, I mean, that's really. You're not you're not going out on a limb there by saying that. One yeah. Bit. Okay, well, because I was like, you're, well... You're, you're, only, you're only stating what a lot of people have noticed. Yeah. And a lot of people would agree with. Because I feel like... The on-the-track results have not 
fared well for Marco, whereas Graham has at least, I mean, he hasn't been one of the top drivers, but Graham yeah. has always consistently been there and been competitive, whereas Marco, it just seems like he thinks because his last name's Andretti, he's just going to <laughs> automatically be up there. He doesn't perform up to the standards of the rest of the Andretti Autosports cars. So it's not like it's, oh, well, his equipment's horrible. No, he has the exact same equipment. It's just, it's all about the driver. I mean, look, you, you, you can see what Alexander Rossi and Ryan hunter Ray are capable of doing. And even to an extent, I guess, just because they're partially owned, but Colton Herta is another one that, you know, he, they're partially owned by Andretti. So I, I, I don't think it's a hot take at all. I think it's a fair assessment and it's, it isn't anything that you're going out on a limb on. So here's like a, a Tim Kirchin like trivia question. If you ever, uh, if you ever, if it ever pops up anywhere, Danica Patrick led with less than 20 laps to go in both of Dan Weldon's Indy 500 wins. Hmm. I know it was late. I, I mean, that's an unofficial trivia because I, I need to look it. I would need to look it up to make sure the first time. Like obviously we're seeing that it's true at least once. But like, I know when Weldon won in what 2012? Not 2012. 20. Well, no, that's way too soon. 2005, the first time. Yeah, it was 2012 or 2011. Remember, we're watching 2011. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I was like trying to go back I and. Think it, I think it was. I was still in high school when I think it was like 2005. Yeah, it was it was 05 because 04 was, but it definitely wasn't 0, like, yeah, it was yeah. it was 05. He was with he was with Ganassi at the time. No, he was with uh, he was in the uh, Jim Beam the 26 oh, for yeah, Andretti Autosport. Right. That was an car. Yeah, um, because yeah, Danica went over to Ganassi for a while because Danica was in the uh, Argent car for uh, like she was on the same team as Buddy Rice. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like had Danica gotten out of her own way, she could have been very, very success, su successful, especially yeah. if she stuck with IndyCar. But I think her ego got in the way of her skills. And I think had she stuck with IndyCar, she probably could have won an IndyCar championship. Well, think about, like, all the drivers, like – that have made the switch like very few of them it's kind of like when you see college coaches go after like professional jobs like very like uh like like a, a job like coaches in pro sports like you very seldomly like you'll very seldomly get a p carroll or a brad stevens um where they coached in college and or were successful jim and jim harbaugh where and then they went to the nfl and were successful it's like you don't get tony stewart or robbie gordon all that often you more or less see the, you know, Sam Hornish and Danica Patrick and Juan Pablo Montoya, who did end up having a couple of decent years. Um, you know, I think Juan Pablo was more successful than... Well, right, but I mean, still never... Tony, Stewart, Tony not, Stewart's the, the top, the uh, high standard. Right. But, you know, Juan Pablo Montoya was... he. Once he figured out ovals better, yeah, he became pretty competitive. I mean, hey, he ran very well every time they were at IMS. True, but yeah, like the you know Dario even went over to NASCAR for a while, like, and like, I understand that probably like, though is vice versa. Vice versa, when you see NASCAR drivers come down to IndyCar, they're fairly they're pretty successful down there. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it, if you think about it, the, what, it was the year Tony Kanaan won the Indy 500. Kurt Busch yeah. ran in that Indy 500 and was up there in the top 10, top 5 almost the entire race. Right. So, I mean, John Andretti, he's, I mean, he's a more of a NASCAR guy than he was IndyCar. Yeah. And they say that, like, you know, you make the switch to, you know, NASCAR from IndyCar because that's, like, where the money is. And it's kind of like, you know, would you rather be – I mean, I guess the money's 
still better? Like, would you rather be kind of a middle of the road NASCAR driver, or would you rather be like one of the most successful IndyCar drivers? I, I want to be one of the more successful IndyCar drivers. Yeah. Like you can't tell. Mostly, like, mostly because if you're a successful IndyCar driver, there's money there too. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, you're winning races. You got good sponsors. You, you probably won the Indy 500. There's a quicker path to the top. It's kind of like when yeah. it's like when because I've heard the analogy made before. The conversation being made back in the day in baseball with Wade Davis. You know, Wade Davis was a, a middle of the road starting pitcher before he became a closer and became one of the more dominant closers in the league. And it's like, so which is better? Would you? Wow, I did not remember. <laughs> Bertrand Baguette being the leader this late in the race. Um, but yeah, like, would you rather be a, you know, top of the line? Would you rather be middle of the road in a more, like, in a more lucrative situation? Or would you rather be, you know, at the top of the line and try to grind to be the best in that kind of smaller group? And that's what, you know, IndyCar essentially would be. Yeah, I would see yeah. He's, he's, Bertrand is like begging his crew, tell me I have enough gas. Tell me. <laughs> Say those words to me. Wow. So yeah, Baguette, like, hadn't raced in IndyCar like in a year, basically. That's crazy. think we came this close to having an Indy 500 winner with the last name Baguette. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested to see when the, uh, so Danica's coming down, we have Baguette in first, we've got Frankiti second, former, no, he's the one who took over for uh, Weldon in the 10. J.R. Hildebrand was third. So the guy who's going to be leading on the final lap of the race right now is 17 seconds back. And the guy who's going to win the race with 10 laps to go is 25 seconds back in seventh. And there's no more cautions. So obviously they're going to work through some like pit stops here. But that's insane. Yeah, it is. funny is we didn't we just saw weldon go by not that long ago and all of a sudden here comes baguette yeah i mean baguette baguette was closer to the back end of um weldon than weldon i mean weldon was closer to becoming a lap down than he was to getting to the lead at this point right that's that's what's crazy to think there he is, just he's a few cars up ahead. Goes Baguette right around the guy to bump his way in. If his name comes across, I will remember it. Was it Alex Lloyd? Yeah. The Boy Scouts car? Maybe, yeah. yeah. I just remember Alex Lloyd when he had like the the pink car and it he, like went around as Pink Lloyd that whole like month of May. But he bumped his way in. This is, and this was before the Grand Prix was the thing, right? To 2011. Oh yeah, yeah. So like, not to say the that Grand like Grand Prix's only been around for like. Six years? Yeah. Five, six years? Not now? to say that it would ever be a situation where, like, you'd rather win that one, but, like, you couldn't even say, well, hey, well, at least we got one win at Indy this month or anything like that. Like, this is still when you work the entire month to get to this point. Yeah. So it's crazy. I had a much different – that's what's that's what's great about, like, going back and watching these is that, like, I had a much different – like, when I was trying to remember things about this race – um, I was like, I remembered, like, some different things about this race as far as, like, I thought Hildebrand, like, led a good portion of the last bit of the race. 
and he was not. <laughs> he, he had six laps to go. He's not even at the front yet. Yeah, six laps to go, and it's still Bertrand Baguette. Yeah. I mean, he's not showing any signs of slowing down either. No. And that's what's so fun about looking back at these two, because you're like, wait, I know how this turns out. So, like, how do we get there? Like, I was there. Guy, how did this guy lose it? Yeah. I remember when this was Charlie Kimball's rookie year. I remember this because watching it on TV, they made such a big deal about how at pit stops they would check his uh, blood sugar levels since he's diabetic. Yeah. And he would basically do a, a blood test, a blood sugar test, every pit stop. Or he had actually had some way of testing it in the car, I remember, so that if he needed uh, a shot of like insulin or a, something like that, they could get that to him during a pit stop. And actually, the shot that he used was his sponsor on the car, so that's oh. why it was such a big, nice. a big deal. So I just looked it up. There were 23 lead changes in this race among like 10 drivers. Like that's nuts. That is. And that's what like, and that's what shows you it's a pro. Like, and I'm not trying to take a dig at NASCAR here, but that, like, that's what shows you it's like a problem with the like NASCAR as a product when it comes here. Like, you can have an exciting race at Indy. It's possible. We see it with a different series, but like, that's, right, that's because this track was built for this series. Right. Right. And every adjust. A lot, most of the adjustments they make to this track are adjustments in line for this series uh, see i would technically, if, technically technically this track owns this series so true you want to have the best show possible for um this series when it comes to basically its namesake if i'm gonna lose on fuel strategy i'd rather it be like with four laps to go i, I won't lie <laughs> if i'm gonna lose because I didn't have enough gas, I'd rather it happen with four laps to go than like with two laps to go. I'd be <laughs> just, just I would be like, I would tell my team like, hey, just let them know. I if if I hit the, if I hit the yard of bricks with two to go, I'm staying out. I don't care what you say. I'm just doing it. <laughs> we're we're gonna we oh, yeah. I'm gonna hope you're wrong. So you just hope you just hope that your lead is as big as Alexander Rossi's was, and you can just basically go right speed all the way around like. Your one lap just takes forever. That's essentially. Dude, Weldon's still fifth. Like, bro, get up there. We know how this ends. <laughs> yeah, there's two laps to go. Oh, no, now he's in third. Okay, so yeah, people must be pitting now. Well, I think the, some of the Ganassi drivers were on fuel conservation. Yeah. And their numbers just didn't line up. So after. Years of trying. There he is. You can see him making moves back. You can see him make a move. Yeah. Further behind Hildebrand. Years. Years of trying for Panther. Sam Hornish, so close. And here it is, Jared Hildebrand. Yeah. He's closing in. Yeah. But, I mean, with that distance, on the last lap, you're like, game, set, match. Hildebrand, you have won. Yeah. All you have to do is not screw up. That's all you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> navigate around. Hit your marks. Navigate yourself around. Take the checkered flag. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. And Wait. here he comes. This is when he gets into his. I think around this, this car right here screwed him up. This car right there screwed him up. Yeah. Made him lose wow. his mark. He couldn't hit his mark because there was a slower car right there. Dan makes the pass. And to think, Hildebrand could have skid across the finish line. If he, if he had a big enough gap on Weldon, right. he could have skid across the finish line wrecked as a wrecked car and won the race. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, and then to make matters worse, he hit turn one wall. Actually, yeah. Turn two. I think at that point he was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just running it right into the fence. I don't even care anymore. Graham finished wow. third. Nuts, man. Dude. 
And it's funny how, like, your perceptions have changed, because, like, when Weldon won in 05, it was, like, my perception of him, I mean, granted, in 2005, I was, what, 13 or 14, like, my perception was, like, he he's, drives for Andretti, he's won a bunch of races, he's kind of cocky and arrogant, and, like, not to say that he needed to be taken down a peg, but, like, he obviously isn't racing for that, you know, known of a team. He's not, you know, in the same position by any means that he was in 05. And so, like, I was actually really super excited, even though I wanted Panther to win because Panther, like, is also a lesser-known team. You know, I, I was happy to see him get the win here. You know, I was not disappointed with the outcome. I was just, I was disappointed for J.R. Hildebrand because that sucks. <laughs> Yeah. That's like Yeah. I, I almost wondered did he zone out there a little bit? Yeah. Like he was in utter disbelief. Here he is coming around turn four. He can see the checkered flag almost. Yeah. And in that slower car on the inside. That is an epic shot right there. Yeah. What a great drive. Hildebrand is shaking his head. Yeah. That's crazy. But to see somebody like Dan Weldon who just absolutely loved Indianapolis yeah. get a second victory. That that was what the cool part was. Yeah. Um you know, every none of the drivers take it for granted, obviously, because it's the Indy five hundred. But it was it, it was just something different for for Dan Weldon, um, you know, much like kind of when Tony Kanaan won, yeah. you know, loves Indianapolis. Elio when he's when he's won, he loves Indianapolis. But Dan Weldon took it to a different level. I mean, th you got to remember, Dan Weldon was not racing a full season this year. This was almost like a one-off race right. for him. He was in the broadcast booth majority of the time. Uh, during this season so for him to win this race um, at the track one of the tracks that he loves so much because when he first initially this is very common knowledge that when he first came into the series he didn't really respect Indianapolis it was it, he didn't really quite understand why is this such a big deal it it is what it is it's it's a track but after he raced there for the first time and after he, um, you know, got to, got around the fans there, he, he learned quickly what it, it was more than just a track. And every time that he went out on the, out on the, the, the course at IMS, he fell in love with it even more. So for him to be able to win this, this is, this is the lasting memory that everybody will have of Dan Weldon. Just the emotion that you see from him as he's getting out of the car here shortly. Uh, you can just see what this means to him, um, not just for the team, but him as, as a driver and knowing the historical ramifications this has uh, just because it's Indianapolis. So many emotions must be going through your mind. What did you think when you came around four and saw Hildebrand in the wall? You know, I was just trying to go as hard as I could. I knew it was the last lap, and they said that they, a lot of those guys were struggling on fuel. And um, I just kept pushing. You know, I just want to say thank you, obviously, to my wife for the for support through uh, being a part-timer right now. So it's a fantastic achievement to the fans for being here. For for Brian Herder and everybody at Brian Herder Autosport that, you know, have uh, just just given me such a dream ride. And uh, there's, there's so many other people I want to thank. I want to thank Honda. Honda have always been behind me 110%. There's, there's no organization like Honda. William Rast, I mean, uh, totally my star. It's a great sponsor for me. I feel like a fashionista, so... I'm going to be wearing jeans tomorrow night. I know I'm supposed to dress smart, but I'm going to be wearing my William Rass jeans and, uh, you know, Curb Records, Big Machine Records, Fourth Size Solutions. I go, it's been, uh, it's been absolutely phenomenal, but I love Indianapolis. I, I, I love the people. 
You know, I love everything about it. The tradition, the history, uh, Firestone. I just, I don't know what to say anymore. I, you know, I'm, I'm not- Take us back to the moment that you actually saw Hildebrand in the wall and you knew you were going to win the Indianapolis 500. I just felt a lot of relief. <laughs> um, obviously I knew it was okay because I could see him moving, but um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible feeling. I've been a runner up the, the two years before this and I never gave up. I mean, Kanaan nearly put me in the wall going into three, which was, which was very, very interesting. But um, there's, there's, there's a lot of great storylines today and uh, I wanna, I want to say hi to my family back home and my mother. And, uh, you know, the Alzheimer's Association for uh, giving me the opportunity to represent them. Um, it's just an incredible day. Congratulations. Dan Weldon, the winner of the Centennial Anniversary Indianapolis 500. Taking my kids to Disney, baby. I'm taking my kids to Disney. You could sense the emotion when he talked about his mom. You heard Vince explain why. And look at that elation as the celebration has just begun for Brian Hurd of Motorsports and his man, Dan Weldon, now a two-time winner of the Indianapolis 500.